Hello, my name is Kira, and I'm going to take you through this set of slides that should guide you through the process of creating a theory of change for your service or program. Briefly, I'm a service improvement specialist from Dartington Service Design Lab, which is a research charity working across England and Scotland and focusing on improving outcomes for children and young people. For our session today, we're going to first look at the objectives of the session and some of the language we'll be using before diving into the content. We will begin with an introduction to developing a theory of change. What is a theory of change? Why might you need one? What can it do? And then a framework designed by Small Steps Big Change and Dartington's a structure thinking around your theory as you develop it. And then we'll go on to apply this theory to your situation. By the end of the session, we are hopeful that you will be, understand what a theory of change is, how, why it's valuable, what makes a good one, and how a single service relates to the wider system, and how this influences the development of a theory of change, and identify and describe the key decisions and core principles that are necessary when developing a theory of change for a service. We hope you'll be able to apply and this framework of decisions to your program and service. Language can be a tricky thing, and there are a few words that we'll be using in this session that have at times meant different things to different people. It's helpful to clarify what we mean when we say the following, and we advise you to print the slide out if, it, if it's helpful to use it as a reference. Making sure that language is accurately and precisely used means that we can be sure that we're all talking about the same thing. So uh, a service is an activity, strategy, program or intervention that is put in place to think of, to bring about a change. So for example, that could be a breastfeeding support service. An outcome is the change expected from the service and often it's used interchangeably with impact, effect, difference, change, result, consequence. In our breastfeeding support service example, we're talking about probably an increase in breastfeeding rates. We'll also talk a bit about systems, um, which would be the wider context in which a child develops and in which a service is de delivered. And in our breastfeeding example, this might be a system of people like the health visitor or midwife or peer supporters or the family members. It would include things like phone helplines like Lalesh and probably baby milk producers and other people who have a stake in the mother's decision and her ability to sustain breastfeeding. Our last um, imperfect term is assumptions which are underlying beliefs or rationales about how or why the service can be expected to lead to an expected outcome. For breastfeeding, this would include things like service availability, acceptability, or the service being able to meet the needs presented, or the service being acceptable to parents. That, and an initial assumption that the mothers who attend will actually want to breastfeed. These are all assumptions to be challenged and tested in the course of implementation. So we begin with our introduction to developing a theory of change. Let's reflect. Have a think about what you know about theories of change at the moment. That could be positive or negative, but whether it, whichever it is, is likely to affect how you're able to engage with the session. So I'd invite you to write down some, uh, some ideas that you have about theory of change and how you've seen them used and how you think they could be and should be used. It might be useful to pause the recording at this point to give you some more time. We're moving on to defining a theory of change. So what is a theory, a good theory of change? Here's an example uh, of the theory of the good behavior program, which is an evidence-based program delivered in schools. The good behavior program is for children in schools. So target audience is children in schools who may be experiencing poor mental health and well-being. They receive activities and strategies. They receive a game uh, based on a set of classroom wide rules, which uses interdependent group contingencies, clear classroom expectations, teacher and student self monitoring, and positive reinforcement to teach the students self management skills and reduce aggressive and disruptive behavior. Uh, the outcome, uh, what they hope to achieve in the short term, is improved self management skills and improved behavior in classrooms. And in the longer term, better learning in the classroom and more pro social behavior and reductions in risk-taking behavior. And research and evaluation has found that they have actually found these things. So this is why this intervention has got the, um, is now called an evidence-based program. So you can think of a good theory of change like a roadmap that helps you and anybody else, like stakeholders, community members, others, understand the who, the how, and the what of your service. 
a good theory of change to enable clear, transparent and intentional design and evaluation of your service. If everyone agrees about the change you are here to see and what needs to happen to get you there, then you can be confident that you're measuring the right things to understand whether things are going to according to plan. It can be a creative process. Thinking backwards from the outcome you want to see or the problem you are here to address. If you want to improve behavior in the classroom to support learning, what are the conditions and strategies necessary that you might need to put in place? What are you doing already? What might be added? What strategies do you have that are not pulling their weight in terms of pushing towards change in the right direction? The best way to approach a theory of change is to see it as organic, meaning it, it grows and develops, and flexible, meaning it responds to new learning as it emerges. It's a theory after all. It should be tested and explored and improved upon as you learn more and grow in your understanding of what you're trying to do. Why? Why create a theory of change? We think that it keeps things real. Often a service is designed when the room is full of enthusiasm and optimism, which is great and how it should be. Creating a theory of change brings the necessary real world in and creates an opportunity to ask questions about things that have been assumed by the group and was that a wise assumption? And to explore the shared understanding about whether A will in fact lead to B and the grounds upon which we base this claim. By saying things out loud and collectively and publicly, we can collect an opportunity for voices in the room to listen to the questions, the group assumptions and group assumptions if that's necessary. Listening to each other is really important when you create and revise your theory of change. This realism bring, brings clarity. What is needed versus what's available and what's pos possible in your context? What is the realistic roadmap for how we will negotiate the constraints and contextual factors when make things get tricky? There's no such thing as a blank canvas and you will have to work with people with different skills and trainings and personal favorite topics and priorities. All of this needs to be understood in order to build upon it in a realistic way. The clarity and shared understanding that you create becomes the compass throughout implementation. You can refer to it to make sure you're not lost or confidently striding out in the wrong direction. You can use it to check in with people. Does everyone still agree that this roadmap is the right one for us? Not all theory of change look the same, depending on who you want to see and understand it. You might want to emphasize different parts, change the language, pick up some graphics and illustrations, but they should all do the same thing, to spell out where the magic happens and how, and why you hope does it make a difference. You can see here three different examples of theories of change that have been described for different people with different priorities and different contexts. So let's move on to the framework for developing a theory of change. We have one system, three key decisions and five core principles. Let's start with one system. We know that in early childhood, uh, development is the product of interplays between nature and nurture. How a child's genes and temperament is expressed, influenced by their immediate environments and the wider context around that. A critique of some theories of change is that they are too narrow, focusing only on a service in isolation without considering the wider systems of influence. We know that early childhood development is the product of interplays between nature and nurture, how a child's genes and temperament is expressed and influenced by their immediate environments and the wider context around that. We think that it's possible to create a theory of change that recognizes the wider systems that a child exists in and would encourage you to bear this diagram in mind as your theory of change takes place, shape. Who are the actors in each layer of the system? How will they re respond and react to what they're doing? Where are your allies? Where are the potential problems? Where might there be unintended consequences that you should really consider to avoid doing harm? When you think about all the influences on a child's development, it becomes increasingly obvious that to say that one service or one program can claim that an outcome can be attributed to their work is pretty optimistic. We find it more helpful to, to phrase it as contribution. How might this service contribute to an outcome? What part of the jigsaw does it play? How might the service interact with other forces and actors within the system to create an impact on outcomes? Just another aspect of building in the system to your theory of change. Sometimes we map this out, looking at what causes and or contributes to events or outcomes to see how these can create positive or negative feedback loops. 
this can help you see how your service or program might interact with a range of other things happening, maybe at a, at a policy level or in the voluntary sector or maybe in the media. It helps us also grasp a wider understanding of the theory of the problem. What do we think is creating the problem you are here to solve? And why do you think what you are planning on doing or what you're doing should break that chain of command? When you've seen a system map or causal loop diagram like the previous slide, you can see how everything interacts. This connected nature means that you'll have to make some assumptions that things will be constant or things will change based on what you know. There are a few system thinking assumptions articulated here on this slide. There will be plenty more and some will not relate to the system, but will be within your realm or resources or the people you will work with. It's important to take some time to consider what the underlying assumptions might be behind the work that you do at some point during this process. Now the three key decisions. We will be concentrating on thinking about what these three decisions mean for you in the second half of this session. For now, it's important that you know what they are. Basically, it's just what, who and how. If you can confidently respond to these decisions, you'll have a clear idea and, uh, and a shared understanding of the theory that sits behind the work that you do. This understanding will help you explore and probe further, which we hope will lead to a more robust service or program, and therefore greater chance to impact, which is what we're all here for. Lastly, the five core principles. At Dartington, we believe that your service or program will have a higher chance of being impactful if you base it around these core principles. No decision will guarantee your service will work. Again, any theory of change is a hypothesis or a theory of how to, you want to make change. But we think applying these five principles to your decisions will help you to make this hypothesis as well informed and as useful as possible and increase your chances of developing a robust theory of change. The first is that it is informed by what matters. This means what matters in terms of what we know affects child development. For, for, for example, we know that speech and language development has an impact on loads of outcomes later on, from academic attainment to behavior. Improving speech and language means tackling something that really matters. Just one example. Second, uh, making sure what you do is informed by what works means looking at the research of what has worked elsewhere. It's a trope to say that there's nothing new under the sun, but it's also true. And there's lots of things that have been designed and tested and will have found to be helpful or maybe even harmful in populations similar to yours. It's important to know this before you start to make sure that you are building on what has come before and not wasting our time. Nobody wants to reinvent a broken wheel. Third, being participatory in co-design design means that all the right stakeholders are involved in the key decisions, these three ones we, we mentioned before. This might include commissioners and staff, as well as those with lived experience who will be most affected, as well as practitioners and those who might have different viewpoints that will be worth taking on board. It might be worth bringing in other actors, such as local businesses or voluntary sectors, if their work is relevant too. Depending on who is in the room, you will probably have to widen your approach and methods. It might be that storytelling is a helpful way to understand an issue and potential ways to forward from a community perspective. Be aware of inclusive language and make sure there's plenty of time for questions within a diverse group. Fourth, precision is your friend, ambiguity is your enemy. When there's no shared understanding in terms of concepts and the causes of problems, there can be no collaborative team effort and your work will be undermined by this. Lastly, each decision you make as a team should be aligned. This means that they should all be on the same team, pulling in the same direction. When you make one decision, this will have consequences for others. For example, if you want to improve literacy levels, it makes sense to spread your limited resources thinly and work with everyone by design, defining your target population as all people. By deciding that literacy is your outcome, your target population will be those at risk of experiencing literacy and those who directly support them for maximum benefit of your efforts. All right, we've come to end, the end of part one. Well done, you. Have a cup of tea and a break. Come back in 15 minutes and we will crack on with part two. Welcome back. I hope you feel refreshed. 
while you finish your tea, we'll get on with part two. We will begin with the three key decisions. At Dartington, we always start with what? What outcome? This makes sense to us because we're in the UK and we are most often working with people who are commissioned to address a problem. The financial resource that we receive to do the work is attached to changing or improving something. This means that the outcome is fixed for us. It's usually easiest to start with whatever is fixed, the bit that you have the least control over. For some, it might be an activity that you do that is well accepted and loved, and you want to see what effect this might be having, maybe in order to set up a monitoring and evaluation framework. In that case, you would start with how. But we start with what, because that's what's fixed for us in the UK most often. What? Outcomes are usually difficult things to shift, and as a result, they change over time, hopefully supported with a little help from your service. They do not happen immediately. Things that happen or that can be measured immediately are usually more likely to be outputs or measurements of program activity rather than changes as a result of that activity. It's an easy mistake to make, so take time to ensure you are clear on the difference. We find it helpful to divide the outcomes into different buckets. Long-term outcomes are the enduring changes that you're here to see, but as we have said, they often take years to materialize, and in most cases, you'll be out of the picture by then. Because of this, we identify short-term or intermediate outcomes, which are the green shoots of progress that give you hope that in the longer term, outcomes will be seen someday. So intermediate or short-term outcomes should provide confidence of the initial stages of development of longer-term outcomes. They are intimately related. Sometimes this, this is something that slips, so check that yours still clearly lead from one to the other. The term end of service outcomes is sometimes used to denote what you'd be happy to see when a person leaves your care or service. It should be valuable or meaning to them and provide confidence to you. So short term or intermediate outcomes are the green shoots of progress. End of service happen, outcomes happen by the time someone leaves you and the longer term or, intermediate or ultimate outcomes are ultimately what you're here for. As a helpful hint or tip, intermediate outcomes are normally the preconditions. So it might be changes in knowledge, attitude or skills that will lead to changes in behavior. Through monitoring these, you can keep an eye on how they increase or appear to get a sense of any traction or progress you might be making. So here's your chance to have a go. Stop the recording and take some time to consider your outcomes. What is the problem that you are here to address? What would it look like if this was not a problem anymore? This is your longer term or ultimate outcome. What are the green shoots or preconditions for this outcome? These are your intermediate or short term outcomes. Write them into the TSC template that we have provided you with. Now you know what, what changes you want to make, how to go about identifying it, the outcomes of the service and the ways to consider how your service outcomes fit within the wider system of influencing services but we still haven't thought about who we're going to focus on or exactly who you're going to bring to, to deliver this to, to bring the change about. Who? Let's consider this now as defining your target group. Being clear about who you're going to serve is crucial. People with different needs require different services. A general rule is that the less complicated or less serious the problems are, the more ambitious you can be with the outcomes. The more complicated or serious the problems are, the more intensive or lengthy an intervention might need to be. Maybe it makes sense to think of it in terms of the more change they have or they might have or the context they might have to make. The, maybe it makes sense to think of it in terms of the more change they might have or the context might have to make to not be in trouble. It's important to bear in mind that in the world of scarce resources, ruling some people in for your service means ruling some people out. This can feel really uncomfortable, but there are sound impact focused reasons for doing it. Some people would get where they need without your help and working with them will take up scarce resource. Some people have problems that are too complicated or require a higher level of support than you can offer. Working with them could be wasting their time, putting them off receiving specialist help from elsewhere. Who is in your sweet spot? They need you and you can help them. How might you identify someone in that spot and what would rule them out? For those who need a higher level of support, who can help them and how can you make sure they get this help? Practitioners will need clarity about who to enrol. 
to support their decision making, a target population is the most clearly described in terms of inclusion and exclusion criteria. Some of these criteria will be demographic, particularly for universal services. Some of these will be around the things that can get in the way of achieving the outcomes they need. Some of, the, some of these may mean that a person is right in your sweet spot. They have needs you can meet. Some of these may rule them out. They have more pressing concerns such as urgent housing needs, which means they can't focus on your service right now, or you don't have the skills to meet their needs. There are frequently good exceptions to enroll people who are not in your target population. For example, you might want to avoid creating a stigmatized service for those who are really needy or, or subsidize those who can't afford to contribute with, to those who can, or to include role models. This group can accompany all your service population. You still want to limit your majority of your resources to go in your target population because it's their outcomes that the service should track and hold itself accountable for. But it's important to be clear about this difference. Now is your chance to think about your target population. Pause the recording and take some time to identify who is in your sweet spot and how you might find them and make sure they have access. It might be worth it considering what, what you will advise practitioners to do when they come across someone who needs a higher level of support than what you can provide. Otherwise, it will be too difficult not to work with them and they will not receive the help they need and they may take up a place from someone else who might benefit greatly. Now you know what the outcomes are that, and who you want to work with. Now let's consider how you will help them to get there. We're going to define the service now. What you do is key to achieving the change you want. Funding, other constraints will have an influence, but the service you design has to be sufficient to get your target population to the outcome <clears throat> you're aiming for. The key decisions you have to make are, what is it that you're delivering? Does it address the needs of your population? Will they find it relevant? Is it likely to change things for them? How often and for how long? As we said before, the greater the needs, the more ambitious your outcomes, the longer and more intense your service will need to be to make a proper change. Who should deliver it? What skills and experiences are needed amongst your staff? And what ongoing support, maybe supervision, do they need to deliver well? Where and when, what settings and timings mean that it will be um, well accepted, people will come and convenient for the target population. Maybe there are conditions that mean that it can't be delivered in the school because people have had bad educational experiences or something like that. You'll need to consider the effect of the environment and the timings on how well people receive what you're offering them. It's easy to think of design early in terms of central activity to offer, for example, mindfulness training for smoking cessation or counseling and diet choices during pregnancy. But your design should extend through how you attract and enroll service users, how you support them to complete the service, and maybe some aftercare if appropriate. Your service design should be based on a combination of best available evidence about what works and what service users and staff will find feasible and acceptable. Increasingly, we've been asked to support organisations to identify what they believe are the core things they should do so that everyone should receive roughly the same thing to increase the chance of successful change and the things that can be flexed to suit users and staff. This is in line with an increasing trend that we see towards personalisation of services. We find the mobile phone as core is the operating system is a really nice analogy. So the operating system is the core. This is the same in every mobile phone and it cannot be tampered with. This is what makes it work, and to tamper is to interfere, interfere with the chances of it working. The, app, the flex is the apps and the covers that can be changed to suit the users and the staff. Apple are very clear that you cannot open your phone and you cannot mess with what's inside, otherwise it won't work. And in the same way, defining the core helps practitioners and, and evaluators to understand what you understand to be the, the magic ingredients that create the change. For them to adapt and flex when conditions and context to conditions and context can mean survival. When practitioners make small changes in response to what they see or hear, can mean that something lands much better in a certain context, based on their understanding of that context. The important thing is then to be super clear on, on what is core and what, what should not be changed so you can remain confident of impact. Take the example of pepper moss. 
when the industrial revolution happened, moths that changed color to reflect the pollution on the trees were less visible to predators and therefore survived. This change of color does not affect what the moth is, how it operates, but if this change enables it to maintain successful mothing throughout the huge changes in its environment. Often practitioners know what needs to be changed for survival or increased attractiveness or effectiveness. As long as they are unclear on how this does not compromise the core, they should be support free and supported to innovate together. A good theory of change will help the team to do this intentionally and collectively as well. We find it's also often helpful to rely on a team of community members and um, service users, often ex-service users, to inform these changes, to make sure that what we have works for them as well as for the practitioners. Now pause the recording again and consider what needs to go into your core and what might define the flex of what you do. Consider too, what is the evidence available to back up your decisions? It might be years of practice, research or scientific evidence, lived experience from a group or just a hunch. None of these are bad, but considering the confidence you have in each of these will help steer your evaluation to focus on the parts you have less confidence in in the future. Now you have the bare bones of your theory of change. Take some time to draw the links between the activities and the strategies just you have described to see how they link to your intermediate outcomes and then on to your ultimate outcomes. What is the balance here? Are all the intermediate outcomes equally supported by strategies? Do you have confidence you'll be able to create change when you look at all you do in the round? Do you have the potential here, if implemented well, to impact on all of your outcomes? Is it reasonable to anticipate this will lead to enduring change? Is it logical to think that these strategies will create these outcomes? It's important to note now that a theory of change is never finished. You will be learning as you go, as you collect understanding and information, either formally through evaluation or informally as you remain curious. It's important to write it down, but in pencil, but make it your favorite pencil because you take care and it should represent your best understanding right now. As we said, this is not the end of the journey, this is the beginning. After completing this process, what are your reflections on theory of change? How do they compare with the reflections you had at the beginning of this session? Can you see how a theory of change might support the work you do and how might you use it? Who do you plan on sharing it with and in what form? How might you make it even more useful? What are your next steps to make your theory of change really work for you? What needs to happen? If you draw up a list of jobs to be done, it might be helpful to consider the task acronym to make delegation easier. Who is responsible for the task? Do they have the authority to be held accountable? Do we agree that they're set up for success? Do they have a checklist of what needs to happen to accomplish the task? It's also really important to agree what finished and done looks like. What will you have and what will you be able to do when this delegated task is complete? We are really grateful that you spent time with us learning about theories of change and we thank you for your time and for your attention. We really hope you found it useful. We want to hear from you, essentially. We want to improve and learn from what your experiences of this session. Whether you found it helpful or not, you can tweet us at Dartington SDL or email at tsctraining at dartington.org.uk. We'd like to hear what you loved, what you learned and what you longed for. Let us know how we can improve what we do or whether you'd like to work with us more. Thank you.